today on Let the Bible Speak. It was a small little gathering on a Sunday night, but one man missed a great experience. His story next on Let the Bible Speak. And greetings to you. Thanks for joining me for Let the Bible Speak. If we had the opportunity to personally meet with Jesus in the flesh, would any person who claims to be a Christian miss such a chance? I would go so far as to say that many who are not Christians would see such an opportunity. In the New Testament, we read about a man who for one reason or another did not attend a gathering of the Lord's disciples, and he missed out on a great deal. Admittedly, he had little reason to think that anything extraordinary would take place that night. In fact, under the circumstances, he probably thought it would be a depressing time to be in that meeting. We read his story in the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, and I'll pick up the reading in verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The record doesn't tell us where Thomas was or what he was doing. What we do know is that he missed a great encounter with the risen Christ. I want us to learn together today from the man who missed the meeting after a song from the congregation. The events of our text took place on the first day of the week, the Sunday upon which Jesus resurrected from the dead. It was a day of many emotions. On one hand, it had only been three days since the dead body of Jesus had been retrieved from the cross and laid in Joseph's tomb. In the minds of the disciples, the burial of Jesus represented the burial of all their hopes and dreams. They had not understood Christ's promise to rise from the dead, so as this Sunday had dawned, they were sad. The road they had walked the past three and a half years had come to a dead end. Their visions of a messianic kingdom now dashed by the death of their teacher and soon to be king. They felt lost and did not know where to go from here. But the first rays of that Sunday sunrise brought new hope, first to the women at the tomb, then to John and Peter, and eventually to the other apostles as rumors began to spread of the empty tomb and the possible resurrection of Jesus. The conclusive proof came that evening as the disciples gathered in a secret room. And oh, the wonder and the joy they must have felt as suddenly, miraculously, Jesus appeared in their midst and showed them the wounds in His hands and in His side. I don't know that they knew what they were looking at. They were certainly in a state of disbelief and wonder. But the Bible says, Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. A Sunday night meeting that began with questions and perhaps doubt ended with joy and exhilaration 
as the disciples left, knowing that their Savior was risen from the dead. But, and unfortunately, when you talk about great things happening in the church, there is usually a but. But the Bible says, Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. We're not told where Thomas was or what he was doing at the time. I don't think it's far-fetched to assume that he was depressed, perhaps off moping somewhere in solitude. He has often been described as the pessimistic and skeptical disciple anyway, and so perhaps he is off to himself, disillusioned and downhearted. Maybe he was thinking to himself, I knew this was all too good to be true. I wasn't so gullible to not have my reservations about all of this. And you know, sometimes doubt and discouragement lead Christians today to grow weak in their faith. I don't know if that's what happened with Thomas or not, but I do know that wherever Thomas was, he was not with the other disciples when Jesus appeared to them on this night. And I also know he missed a great blessing by not being there. And so it is with many who claim to follow Jesus today. Whatever keeps them away keeps them from enjoying many great things in the Christian life, whether they realize it or not. And something certainly keeps many Christians away from gatherings of Christ's disciples today. Numbers when it comes to church attendance continue to dwindle year by year and generation by generation. And in nearly every church you visit, the same thing is true on Lord's Day morning. There may be a few missing because they put something or someone in their life before Christ, but generally you have the makeup of the church there on Sunday morning. And of those who do attend on Sunday morning, you can generally cut that number in half on Sunday night. And if the same church meets midweek, you can cut the number by even more. Why is that? It's not a mystery. Now, if you have legitimate reasons why they're not able to attend every meeting of the local church, perhaps sickness or age or some extenuating and unavoidable situation causes them to not be able to attend on Sunday night or Wednesday night or the gospel meeting or revival as they would like to. Usually, though, if we're honest with ourselves, these are the things that keep most members away. Perhaps it is that worldly, worldly things interest us more. Uh, maybe we see money or position in the company as worth sacrificing spiritual things for. Perhaps we feel a stronger tie to earthly family than we do to God's family. Maybe it's simple laziness or it's apathy and the lack of a spiritual appetite. But these and many other things keep many a professing Christian away from the meetings of the church. Here in this post-resurrection account, though, we can see what all Thomas missed by being wherever he was instead of where he might have and probably should have been, and that is gathered with the other disciples on this important night. Let's consider some of the things that Thomas missed when he missed this Sunday night meeting. First of all, he missed the fellowship of brethren who could have encouraged him, and he needed that. The last week had been traumatic for all the disciples, and they had all experienced a wave of emotions. They began the week with Jesus being hailed as a king by the multitudes along the winding road into Jerusalem. But now they've ended the week with the religious leaders and Romans finally putting him to death and the religious crowd that had been, uh, that had been uh, shouting, Hail him! Now saying, Nail him! The movement that Jesus had started was now seemingly in danger of falling apart and them all going home and trying to put some kind of life back together without Him. If there was ever a time when they needed encouragement and to draw strength from one another, it was that night. They didn't understand all of Jesus' promises. They didn't know what to make of all of the rumors and the resurrection appearances of Christ. But here they are, huddled together, trying to make sense of it all and trying to find some refuge from the storm that they had been caught in and it was in that sacred hour as night was about to fall that Jesus granted to this faithful few a miraculous appearance and they knew that He was indeed risen again. You know, Thomas needed that encouragement, but he didn't receive it because he was not there. Second, Thomas missed seeing with his own eyes the risen Lord. What a tremendous experience that was when Jesus suddenly appeared in their midst and they saw his wounded hands and sighed. Yet here he was alive and in his glorified form. They had seen him do great wonders over the last three and a half years. They'd seen him walk on water. They had seen him give sight to the blind. 
They had seen him restore twisted and withered legs and feet. Three of them had seen the transfiguration. They had even seen him raise others from the dead, such as Lazarus. But I would suggest to you that the greatest thing they had witnessed in their lives to this point was to see the resurrected Christ appear to them in that meeting that night. Not only because of the miracle, but because of what it all meant. Thomas missed that experience, and because Thomas missed that, he lived in unbelief and doubt and perhaps great spiritual jeopardy for an entire week, for it would be eight days before Christ would appear to them and to Thomas again. And a week is a long time to be shrouded in the kind of doubt that Thomas must have found himself in in that critical time in history. You see, Thomas missed out on the peace that came from that meeting with Christ. What did Jesus say when he appeared to them? He said, peace be unto you. And we know that when Jesus speaks peace, it calms the fiercest of storms. And it ended up calming the storm that was raging in their hearts that night. But Thomas didn't know anything about that. You know, many Christians don't truly know peace in their hearts because they have one foot in the church and the rest of them is outside in the world. They're torn inwardly with doubt and with inner strife. The world pulls and tugs at them and they give in. No wonder they don't have spiritual peace claiming to know Jesus. Thomas also missed a great promise that was made that night. In verses 21 through 23, So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now here Jesus is granting promises that pertain to the apostles and the apostles alone. He describes the apostolic work that was ahead of these men as witnesses of his resurrection. He symbolically imparts the promise of the Holy Spirit as he had told them in John 14 and six, or chapters 14 through 16. The Holy Spirit who would equip and empower them to do the work that only the apostles of Christ could now do. Well, Thomas was an apostle. Thomas was to have a part in this work. He had been there when Jesus had told of these things in those final meetings before the passion of Jesus. But the next verse says, Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. Thomas missed that sacred moment. He spent another week excluded and alone in his doubts because for whatever reason he missed the meeting that night and he missed some wonderful things that he desperately needed in his life whether he realized it or not. There are many, many Christians who miss out on the fullness of Christ and the blessings of the Christian life and citizenship in Christ's kingdom because they're just not dedicated to the kingdom of God. They're, not, they're, they're willing to miss the meetings of the church. They're willing to miss out on many of the great opportunities of the Christian life. You know, we're living in a strange and difficult time where spiritual things are concerned. You know, for perhaps the first time since the beginning of the Christian faith, the idea is being commonly accepted that one can be a Christian and live the Christian life with little to no involvement in the local church, no membership in the church, no faithfulness to the local church. I meet people all of the time that feel that way. They call themselves Christians. They say they follow Jesus, but they have no faithful and regular involvement and attendance to the affairs and the works and the assemblies of the local church. Millions of people claim to love and follow Jesus but see no need to be a member of a local church and faithfully attend it. Friend, it is God's will for local Christians to make up a local congregation and to regularly, as that congregation, assemble. That's, that's God's design. That's God's plan. It is impossible, and I want to stress that, it is impossible to be a faithful Christian without being a faithful part of the local church. Now as unpopular as that may be today, that's simply what the Bible teaches. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 described the local church as a body made up of many members joined together in one with Christ as the head. Well, if you're a Christian, you're to be a part of that local body. You're a member in that body. and You can't be a living, functioning member of that body detached from the rest of the body. 
The apostle who wrote Hebrews commanded the believers whose faith was in danger of growing weak in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. It is more, you see, than merely a duty we have to worship God. It is a duty that we have to one another and an opportunity that we're given to build up others in the faith and advance the cause of Christ. And my friend, I want you to see that that's not a suggestion. That's a direct command given by the Holy Spirit through the inspired apostle to Christians. The historian Luke indicates to us in Acts chapter 2 that the early disciples were together in some capacity nearly every day. I'm going to tell you whether you believe it or not, you cannot live the Christian life alone. And you cannot please the Lord and refuse at the same time to be part of the church for which He died. And you by yourself don't constitute the church. I don't constitute the church. We're a part of the church. Yes, the church is the people. But when the Bible speaks of the church, the people, the church, it refers to them in the context of being together as a body of people, joined together spiritually and many times physically in assembly. Now, why would any Christian who desires to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, as Jesus made imperative in Matthew 6 and verse 33, why would such a person not want to be there every time the church comes together to build itself up in spiritual things? Let me give you some reasons why faithful Christians should attend every service of the church they can. First of all, and it's reason enough, Jesus is there. The unseen attendant at every gathering of Christ's church is Christ Himself. When the exiled apostle John wrote to the seven churches of Asia Minor in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, he described them as seven golden lampstands. And Jesus told him to write to those churches to the Ephesian brethren, he said, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. The late preacher from Mississippi and my dear friend and mentor, Brother Linwood Smith, he used to preach on that verse. And in his poetic and eloquent way, he would powerfully paint the scene of Christ walking up and down the aisles every Sunday of every meeting house where his people were gathered, looking through the window panes of every soul. Well, if Jesus is there, shouldn't I desire to be there? Isn't that reason enough? We should attend every service because Christians are to hunger and thirst for righteousness. So said Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. And that list of Beatitudes, Jesus is describing the kingdom seeking and the kingdom finding people. And one of their attributes, he says, is they hunger and they thirst after righteousness. Now, of all that Beatitude implies, at the very least, can I claim to hunger and thirst for the things of God? and willfully miss the services of the church where God is being worshipped, where Christ is being preached, and where the scriptures are being expounded? We should attend every service to grow in grace and knowledge as the Bible commands us to do in 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. We should attend every service because by so doing we will encourage others as we read in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 and 25. Friend, it's not just about the encouragement that you need from others you, as, as a Christian, have just as much responsibility to be an encouragement to other Christians. And if you don't take that responsibility seriously, why should anyone else? And if no one takes that responsibility seriously, how does the church even exist? Nearly 30 years ago, when I was a very young preacher, I went to a distant state to hold a week-long gospel meeting. It was, it was a lonely week. It was an isolated place. I'd never been there. The church there was very, very small and struggling. And it was a discouraging situation from the very start. But there was a little band of believers who were trying to keep the cause of Christ alive in that small town and they wanted to have a meeting. They all showed up on Sunday when we began the meeting and everyone seemed encouraged to be having a meeting. And it made me encouraged to be there. On Monday night, however, everyone wasn't there. Some missed. And then they missed Tuesday night and Wednesday night and Thursday night. Well, it sort of cast a pall over our little meeting. The mood was dampened. 
One person who was conspicuously absent was a young man who could have been a great asset to the church there and to our meeting. He was a member, and he could have provided a spark of interest that sometimes only young people can provide if he didn't provide anything else. But after Sunday, he didn't attend. I wondered what happened to him, and one night after service, I returned to the home where I was staying, which was his grandparents' home. When I walked through the door, there he was. He was laid back in the recliner with the remote control in his hand, watching some television show. And I said, well, we've been missing you the last several nights, and I sure wish you were there. Now, I've heard all kinds of excuses through the years, but this one was unusual. It was pitiful and honest at the same time. He had a guilty look was kind of embarrassed. He hung his head and he said, well, I'm just not strong enough to be there. Now, on one hand, I wish more Christians were that honest because truth be told, that's why most of them aren't there. I hear all kinds of excuses, but truth be told, that's why many of us aren't there when we're not there. At least he admitted it. But did he not realize that's where he needed to be to grow stronger? Didn't he want to be stronger? There was a cause he claimed to believe in that was struggling in that little town in part because he wasn't there. And you see, he not only was forfeiting the strength he might have received by being there, he was also depriving others of the encouragement his own presence and participation could have given. And you have just as much influence as the next person. The question is, are you using it to encourage the church, to build it up, to encourage the cause of Christ, or are you tearing it down and slowly eroding it through your own indifference and worldly preoccupation. We need to attend every service because of the growth it can cause in our own life and in the lives of others. Your presence alone makes a difference. We should, set an ex we should attend every service to set an example for our children and our grandchildren. I was raised in a home where we attended every service we could without deliberation or debate. We didn't argue about whether to go to service or not. We should be at every meeting because we are zealous of good works, Titus 2 and verse 14. We should be there to bolster our faith for the coming week to resist temptation. We should be there lest we be guilty of professing to know God but in works denying Him, as Paul said of some in Titus 1 and verse 16. And finally, we should be present because we are told to always be watching for the Lord's return. Now one of these hours, the Lord is going to come back. The Bible assures us of that if it assures us of anything. With the sound of a trumpet and with a shout, Christ is one day going to break through the eastern sky with His angels. And that may very well be a Lord's day. What a wonderful time for the Lord to return when His people are assembled in praise and worship. And we're told to ever be watching for that moment. Jesus said, Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. How will you feel if the Lord's church is assembled at that moment and you're not there but rather at a ball game or at home watching television or out golfing or fishing or whatever it may be that you could have put off and done some other time? Don't be like Thomas who missed the Sunday night meeting. Yes, Christ gave him another opportunity and appeared eight days later and made a believer out of Thomas. But oh, what peace and what joy and what blessing he missed for an entire week in his life because he missed the meeting. Don't be like Thomas and miss the meeting. Be there and experience the joy of being in the presence of the Lord and His people.
Subscribe to our YouTube channel to see all of our past broadcasts, plus extra videos, including Let the Bible Speak classics all the way back to the 1960s. And get new updates, go to YouTube and search for Let the Bible Speak TV and click on subscribe. The Lord's Day is a special day on God's calendar. It is the day when the Lord resurrected from the grave. It is the day when the Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles on the day of Pentecost and the church was established. And I hope that you will honor and recognize this day as the Lord's Day and make your plans to gather with a group of God's people to worship in spirit and in truth. If we can help you in that search or that pursuit, we'd love to. If you'd like to study the Bible with us, we'd be glad to open the Scriptures and help you to understand God's plan for your salvation and how to become a disciple of the Lord Jesus. If you'd like a copy of our lesson today, we'll be happy to send you the free printed transcript. Ask for the lesson, The Man Who Missed the Meeting. And we'll get that copy on its way. It's free of any cost whatsoever. Thank you for joining us. I hope until we meet again, you'll look us up online, ltbstv.org. Also, we're on YouTube, Facebook, on Instagram. So be sure to like and follow us and subscribe on those various platforms. And tell others about Let the Bible Speak. I look forward to our time here at the Lord Wills next time together. Until then, I hope you have a wonderful week ahead. And may God bless you richly. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by The Church of Christ. For more information, including our past broadcast and sermon transcripts, visit ltbstv.org. Thanks for being with us today. Join us next time for Let the Bible Speak.